Well, Fiskama Huladunia's Felcha. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome uh, to the uh, Justice Subcommittee on Policing. This is our second meeting of 2019. Uh, we have no apologies. Liam MacArthur is going to be joining us. He's a bit delayed with other business. Agenda item one is uh, the decision to take uh, business in private, um, and that's our work programme. Uh, are members agreed with that? Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item two is Police Scotland's priorities 2019-20. Uh, and, and our main item of business today is taking evidence from the Chief Constable, Ian Livingston, on Police Scotland's priorities and draft budget. I, I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And I welcome Ian Livingston, Chief Constable, Police Scotland. Um, I thank uh, Chief Constable and Police Scotland for the, the written submissions received, which are, as ever, very helpful. Now, I understand, Chief Constable, you don't wish to make a, an opening statement for quite pressed for time, uh, a lot of questions we need to follow up in writing. So we're going to move straight to, to questions. Thank you for coming along. Um, and it's to Rona. Thank you, Convener. Good afternoon, uh, Chief Constable. Could I ask you, um, first off, to maybe expand on yesterday's media statements that um, you were planning to recruit 400 um, officers to deal with um, Brexit and the different scenarios that that could uh, raise. And, uh, you know, we, the figure that we have been uh, had evidence on and been working on was 120. So I wonder if you could just maybe expand a bit on that. Uh, you just need to leave the... the, the it'll, it'll happen. Let, the, uh, <laughs> let people who know what they're doing work it. Thank you for that. Yeah, no, apologies. Thank you. Thank you for the welcome. Um, yes, the, the, um, the, there's a number of elements in, 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 in that. Um, in order for us to build a financially sustainable service, we needed to eliminate the revenue deficit that we've been carrying for, for a number of years. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that, but I won't, I won't, I won't delay my response in, in, in regard to that at, at this point. And therefore, we had had a plan through productivity to reduce our officer numbers by the end of 1920 to approximately 16,800. So that's, that's 300 down from, from where we are at the moment. However, because of the um, uncertainty, the vast uncertainty surrounding Brexit and its potential consequences, um, I wasn't prepared at this stage to start that reduction because obviously you would, you would start your recruitment profile and allow the, the, the rundown, if you like, to, to get us to that, that position. Um, so my position was to maintain our officer numbers as they are at, at 17,134. Um, and rather than um, reduce by 300 um, after we'd established productivity, to really keep that that uh, capacity, so we could we could flex it into uh, any demands such as they may be that, that that may arise from Brexit. The issue about the 120, um, which is actually less now than than, than 120, is, is actually only 100. That was actually just I, I've I've tried to bring a, a tranche of recruitment forward. We recruit quarterly, and there was an intake due to come in at the end of March. But really, because of what was imminent, I wanted to see how how, how many of that anticipated 240 we could we could actually recruit in February. Now that all that often takes delays through people are are in employment, people have commitments, vetting issues. So in actual fact, we're going to bring in about 105 um, at the end of February, um, which will put a revenue pressure on to 18, 19, but actually it'll only be really a month's salary for those hundreds between the, because the, the, they're coming forward from, from, from the March intake. So in essence, the plan is not to reduce as we had intended to do uh, until there's greater clarity if, if, if that arises soon, um, simply because I felt it prudent to maintain that capability capacity that Police Scotland has um, for the, 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 the numerous and varied challenges that, that might arise. And would your plans include any recently retired officers, you know, that some that may have retired just before, and to ask them to come back, or, or, or the figures you're talking about? Or... I've heard yeah, I mean, I've heard that, I've heard that put forward. Um, but you will find that, that a, a, a lot of officers, when they come to 30, over 30 years service, the, the, the decision to retire is not taken lightly. It's a massive impact on their families and, and, and on, 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 on their, their personal lives and, and their status. Um, and, and in truth, for a whole host of reasons, changes to tax rules and various other things, once people make up their, 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 their uh, personal decision to retire, that is very much a, a matter for them. Now, 
as ever, we, we you know we would seek to to, to maximise all our resource, which includes you know youth volunteers, includes um, the special constabulary, um, but th there is there is no intention to do anything specifically regarding retired officers. That's very much a personal decision for for that individual officer and his or her family. Yeah. Well, I wonder if I can ask if if um, you'll be profiling succession planning things like that through your your personnel arrangements. The the pay award. Has that had any impact? Is it likely that you know officers may wish to, given the way the pension arrangements are configured, likely to stay on longer? Is that going to alter the profile? Are you going to be retaining officers longer, perhaps two years to benefit from the the, the increased pay award? P potentially, there's no indication of that as as yet. I think what's what's more likely to happen is that we're going to see, in relatively short short time, the significant impact on the the changes to the the, the pension scheme. So the vast majority of officers in, who now serve um, will, will serve for 35 years, will work until the age of 60. Um, and the, 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 the length of a police officer's career will, will, ab will, will absolutely uh, get, get longer. Um, now, there are, there are advantages and disadvantages in that, that we've got a more, a more stable workforce, but it definitely means that the officers are, are, are Perhaps taking more time as as they they develop their, their career rather than the, the sort of pace of development that perhaps ha happened in the past. The impact of the pay award is, is you're right. People may seek to get to the, the sort of head of the increments sort of, uh, as as it were, but there's no there's no evidence at, at this stage around that. Thank you. I think uh, sorry, Rona. I think Margaret. Just, uh, specifically on, on the idea, which I think I'd, I'd muted at the last of bringing in retired officers, I was thinking of it more on a temporary basis during any potential transition period as a contingency plan. And uh, I and uh, understand and hear what the Chief Constable says about um, any effect on pensions, but I suppose with everything in Brexit, we're in new territory and presumably then tax laws could be changed to, to allow that to happen for that period of time, um, say a, a year coming in the voluntary basis, recently retired people, if they were going to do that, it, it's a possibility to, to explore perhaps, which wouldn't have the drain of trying to bring in full-time officers when they may not be required that number, um, you know, later on. I mean, I, I'm, I'm at the stage, I think, like, like everyone needs to be in, in terms of really being being open to anything in regard to how, how how we respond to Brexit. I do think there would be challenges in that. I have I, I did hear that, and I had uh, I did, I did con consider the potential round about that. Um, but again, the the profile of a number of, of officers who are retiring, the the, the, the age profile, the, the the work that they they may have been involved in in the past. Um, you know, my preference is 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 to try and bring bring in new recruits trained. Um, and, and, and committed to, to the organisation that we will get a return on. And, and you're right, there are a number of employment issues, the relationship between any uh, contribution that they might make, tax, their, their, their ongoing pension, pension arrangements. Um, I, was, I was given a, 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 a very bit of quick time brief advice that there, there was numerous issues that would need to be resolved and it wouldn't be a short term uh, uh, solution. But, but in truth, gen genuinely, um, I, I think I think the, the the philosophical point you make is right. We need to be as creative as we can to try and address what, at the moment, are a whole series of of, of unknown uh, potentials. Um, yes, can I ask if there's um, any one particular challenge unique to Scotland that you feel you might have to deal with in uh, any Brexit scenario? <sighs> The, big, the biggest long-term challenge I, I, in terms of any Brexit, because you're right, could, this could yet be a, a well-managed, stru structured approach, but the biggest challenge, undoubtedly, from a policing and security perspective is the, the loss of uh, legal mechanisms and measures that have developed over many years with the other 27 member states. Through Europol, through Eurojust, the use of the European arrest warrant, Schengen intelligence system, Joint, intelli joint investigation teams through the Europol structures, um, and Police Scotland um, have been a, a great beneficiary of that. When the single service came together, we immediately identified that um, perhaps over the years we'd been rather shy at stepping forward and, and seeking some of these European funds to assist our, our, our investigation. So we've had a number of joint investigation teams, an awful lot to do with organised people trafficking, um, 
and, and high-level organised uh, crime threats to, 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 the, to the people of, of Scotland. The use of the European arrest warrant is a great tool um, for not only um, criminals um, who are uh, beyond the shores of Scotland and Europe, but also European criminals who are, who are in our jurisdiction and, and the ability to, to, to remove them quickly. So the long-term challenge is around the, the loss of these legal measures. So other than working within the, the Europol and the European structure, we will now have to recreate a number of suboptimal workarounds on a bilateral basis. So we'll have to have an agreement with the French, we'll have to have an agreement with the Portuguese, with the Germans. Um, and, and, and that, I think, will, will, will be the, challenge, the biggest challenge long term. In the short term, the biggest challenge is the uncertainty. Um, I've publicly uh, reflected, because I think it's right and proper that, that, that we do that, that um, the potential for disorder and, and, and serious public um, disquiet is... is Probably, and I say no more than that, probably less in Scotland than it may be in other parts of the South East in terms of the Channel ports and clearly into the, the border area of, of, of Northern Ireland. And therefore, as such, I think um, Police Scotland's duties, my duty as Chief Constable, is to be prepared to, to support other Chief Constables in other communities across the United Kingdom to, to respond to, to, to those issues, um, as well as ensuring that we have sufficient safety and security uh, at, uh, within, within Scotland itself. So there's a long-term uh, removal of legal measures that uh, Europol, Eurojust and, the, and the, Europe, the framework of justice that exists within Europe that we will no longer be part of, but we will make efforts to minimise the impact of that, but it will still be suboptimal. And then the, sig the second biggest threat, undoubtedly, is the uncertainty of, of, of what the consequences may be. I'm, I'm, I'm understanding from what you're saying that you'll have overall responsibility for any Brexit-related operations that take place, or is there someone going to move in to do that side of it? Oh, I mean, I, I, as Chief Constable, uh, will have absolute overall responsibility. It requires my authority for any officers to be deployed on a mutual aid basis. Uh, the structure, the recruitment uh, uh, um, profile, all matters will be, be will be my ultimate decision. But clearly, it's, we're a you know we're an enormous, large organisation. There are enormous amounts of challenges. We've got some real pressing operational matters that don't go away on, on, on a daily basis. Um, so there is a structure, there's a dedicated team in place that has been there for many years, and there's, 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 there's clear governance and accountability. But the accountability and the responsibility and ultimate decision-making is mine. Okay. Excuse me, I understand we have some technical issues, uh, Chief Constable. Could you maybe, is it lower? Um, f a bit further back from the microphone, please. I beg your <laughs> <Some> <laughs> if I can't get closer to you, I do apologise. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Now, uh, 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 a small final question. Is that all right, Kevin? No. All oh, right, from, yes, yeah, that's fine. Uh -huh. um, just to, to your knowledge, are you aware of any um, discussions that have taken place between the Scottish and UK governments regarding resources and funding um, related to Brexit operations? I'm, I'm not aware of, of, of any discussions. I, I genuinely feel, in terms of operational independence, it's not a matter. For me, I've, I've raised my concerns with the Scottish Police Authority, my, my governance body, um, and have, have put that in writing uh, to them. I've, I've had discussions with officials within Justice about what my assessment and the assessment of the team might be. But the actual sort of final source of funding, if there is any to be made available, I haven't uh, been party to that. Are you able to <coughs> tell the committee what extra resources you feel might be needed? Well, I would I, I would need additional funding um, to to uh, ensure that the the anticipated uh, deficit doesn't get greater. If we don't get an, a, a additional funding, I've taken decisions not to step back in terms of officer numbers, as I as I alluded to at the beginning of um, the, the session, um, and as a consequence of that, that is going to put more financial pressure certainly onto on, onto nineteen. Uh, 20 and and the 300 that I was going to reduce it is, is roughly equates to uh, about 12 and a half million I think I included that in the in in, in the submission um, but actually uh, our assessment of of of, of requirement uh, exceeds uh, simply staying staying as we are um, and again I've I've included that in in some of the assessments assessments made but they are assessments you know I can't the, the, I I've been asked what's your evidence base for that that. It's Brexit. There is, there is no evidence base. What, what I've been asked to do, 
and what the UK are doing, dri driven through uh, the Cabinet Office and, and other elements of uh, business continuity, is, is planning against what, what this odd phrase of reasonable worst-case scenario. So planning against a reasonable worst-case scenario, you do have to imagine things that you really hope will not come to pass, such as significant interference with pharmaceutical supplies, food supplies, some, some public and, and political disorder if, 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 if there are issues in terms of some, some of the more radical fringes in, in, in the political environment and the need to ensure the rule of law and the safety of, of the public. So we've mapped a whole series of scenarios and against those scenarios, our judgment is that we, we would need greater resource than we've got at the moment to ensure that the day-to-day -day policing, the very good day-to-day -day policing that, that happens in Scotland also continues uh, during this difficult time. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Okay, Runner, thanks. I know you have uh, other questions, yes. but there, there are supplementaries on this issue. Daniel, then Liam. F first of all, can I, can I just say what a pleasure it was to meet five of the hundred new officers that you're bringing when I was up at Tilly Allen on, on Monday. Um, but on, on the Brexit issues, uh, first of all, given that Police Scotland is the second largest police force in the UK, I take it the assumption must be that, that, that Police Scotland will be one of the first calls to be made if, if there are requirements elsewhere in the UK. And I was just wondering if that was your working assumption. And secondly, I mean, my understanding is that, that there is funding uh, being created by the Cabinet Office uh, for, for contingency planning uh, around Brexit and transition. It, it is, is, uh, I, I was just wondering if, if that was your understanding and whether or not you'd had any discussions either with the Cabinet Office directly or with um, uh, the Scottish Government about whether or not inquiries are being made as to how to access any funding if it is made available. I, I, I haven't spoken directly to, to the Cabinet Office. Um, I, I would always account through the, the statutory governance framework of the Scottish Police Authority and then back into the Scottish Ministers and, and clearly the, the Cabinet Secretary uh, for, for Justice. Uh, probably like everyone else, I've heard a number of figures getting banded about about what the Cabinet Office may have available. Um, I know f from public record that the Police Service on Northern Ireland have had an additional almost 17 million allocated to them. Obviously, their governance structures are different at the moment. They're, they don't have a, a, a police authority actually in, in place, and they don't have ministers. They're, they're, they're through the Northern Ireland office. Um, where the relationship between Scottish government and UK government sits in terms of Brexit contingency funding, that, 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 that really is not, not a matter for me, and I, I haven't had direct contact with, with ministers or officials in, in, in Whitehall. On the mutual aid point, I think it's a reasonable observation to make that in this instance, um, when you assess the United Kingdom as a whole, th th there's the likelihood that we are, in this instance, more likely to be a, a net exporter than a, than a net importer of, of resource. But as I made very clear yesterday at the public meeting of the, the Scottish Police Authority, that decision is a matter of operational independence of the Chief Constable. I think the criticality of that operational independence is, is clear uh, to everyone in, in, in the, the, uh, the legal system of, of Scotland. And it's a decision I would have to make balanced against my duties and priorities to maintain safety and security uh, to the people of, of Scotland. But what I would also say is that I think it is absolutely right and proper that the Police Service of Scotland are part of that wider UK framework. Um, because uh, when required, we will and we have benefited from the support of, of our colleagues across the UK. So whether that's in regard to uh, the, the, the G8 summit, whether it's as, as, uh, going back as, as far as, as Lockerbie, the attack on, on Glasgow Airport, uh, the, the work around the, the Commonwealth Games, there's instance after instance um, the, the, the visit of uh, the Pope um, when, when he came to Scotland in 2010, um, instance after instance where we've benefited from resource, specialist resources and uh, core uh, resources coming to support the Police Service of Scotland. So I've publicly said I want to be part of that UK framework. I will uh, seek to support uh, Chief Constable colleagues and communities right across the United Kingdom if I can. Um, but my assumption and, and uh, concern is, is aligned, as you said, Mr Johnson. I think, as we're currently structured, it's more likely that we would pr be providing resource than receiving resource. Thank you. Liam. 
that start, Chief Constable, by apologising for being slightly late and missing your, your opening remarks. I apologise for that. In response to Rona Mackay earlier, you were, I think, quite reasonably pointing to the difficulty in terms of scenario planning in, in the absence of, 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 of key information and, and evidence. But have you been able to assess what the, um, the benefit to you in terms of providing some level of certainty would be uh, were the UK government to rule out the prospect of the UK crashing out of the EU with no deal? Is there a, is, is there a, a, a financial benefit uh, in terms of the reduced cost that you've alluded to? I, I, again, and, and to be really, really clear and, 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 uh, and frank, as I always would be um, uh, with, with colleagues, um, our, our planning is not as sophisticated as that at, at this time in terms of actually being able to, to, to specifically say, well, if, if a no deal is ruled out, that will then lead to ABCD because simply saying that there's no hard, you know, if you like, no hard Brexit is going to, is going to happen, you then, you then still need to be, have some contingency for other, <laughs> other consequences that, that, that may, may arise from, from that. I think in terms of the imminence, if, if 29th of March was, was ruled out as, as a hard stop, it would certainly give us more time to start to, to, to look at other scenarios and, and look at uh, other options and perhaps have more, more detailed planning assumptions built in to the work we're doing at the moment. But at the moment, um, uh, we need to make plans for a hard Brexit on the 29th of March. We need to do that against worst case scenario. That is the stated policy of uh, the government in, 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 in London, um, and therefore that it's against that scenario that, that we're currently planning. But I think it's, it's an undoubtedly reasonable thing to say that if that is ruled out, it would put less imminent pressure on police resources and we could start to look at what other scenarios may, may arise, again, depending depending on, on, on the nature of the, the Brexit arrangements. Um, but I mean, you've said that a reasonable worst case scenario is the benchmark you need to use, and that seems that, that seems entirely sensible. But if a no deal option was ruled out, presumably the point at which that um, that that worst case reasonable scenario um, is set is going to be more advantageous in terms of giving you a degree of certainty, and therefore the the, the contingency planning you're doing has to encompass a less broad-ranging um, set of, of, of scenarios, no? Well, it, 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 it would give us more time, but my observation would be it would also then create a number of other challenges, because if a hard deal is ruled out, there then potential, you know, and again, who, who, who can say, but there then could potentially be a, a general election across the United Kingdom, there potentially could be another referendum, there's the, there's the potential likelihood, if there is a delay, of the European elections going ahead, as I assess and ha have, 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 have asked for, for advice on. Now, all of these, or, or any of these, would then give us remarkable challenges. It would not be like a, 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 an election as we would normally police it. You know, the likelihood is more likely to be the referendum we had in 2014, where the turnout is high, um, the, the need for the integrity of the process to be, to be absolutely strong and robust and, and without reproach would be critical and the police would clearly have a role in that. So it would give us a number of other challenges that would also require resource. So I think your fundamental point is right. If it was ruled out of the 29th, it would give us more time and we would be able to be a bit more specific in some of our planning. But it would also then, in my judgment, give us other challenges that we would then have to meet and make sure that we were in a position to respond to. Thank you, Chief Constable. Fulton. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good, good afternoon, uh, Chief Constable. It's, it's following on from the, the points uh, of others, but uh, going back to that um, comment that you made earlier about the bilateral conversations that we need to take place with uh, other member states in the event of Brexit about new arrangements. But that, it's obviously going to be a lot of conversations, but do you know yet if that will be Police Scotland having those conversations or if it will be done at a UK level? Or well, both, perhaps? Both, both is, is, is a short answer. Um, we, we have been uh, 
at the, at the forefront in terms of UK policing, in terms of identifying some, some of the, the potential vulnerabilities. We've had a dedicated team, not in terms of some of the contingency planning regarding a, additional resource and potential disorder and the need to, 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 to support uh, the United Kingdom, but in terms of addressing the, 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 um, the point I made earlier regarding the, the loss of legal measures and, and our exit from the Europol framework, um, we've actually been engaging with a number of the countries at a very early stage. So I've, I've had a number of my officers at different times over to the Baltic country, countries, to Latvia and other parts of Scandinavia, down into to Spain, uh, to, to Portugal, and clearly the, the the structure of policing and the structure of justice is very different in all in all these these countries. That was a great to be to be again to be really frank. That was a great value of Europol. You didn't really have to um, interpret. Was it the police service? Was it the prosecutor? Was it the federal police? The local police? Who you, you just went to Europol. It was an easy place to dock into and and dock out of. So we've started to map that already. We've looked at the countries we have most of our of our business with. Um, you know, again, it wouldn't, wouldn't surprise you. Portugal, Spain, Poland, there's a lot of countries where there's quite significant you know, almost daily contact between the Police Service of Scotland and, and those areas. And, and, a, and while the National Crime Agency have the lead for the United Kingdom, um, and, and we work well with the National Crime Agency, and, and they have a, a, a network, uh, a foreign network that we benefit from, I felt, as Chief Constable, it was also really important to recognise the, the independence of the Scottish legal system and some of the specific challenges that exist for Police Scotland that, that are not always um, um, fully understood. The role of the Lord Advocate and the relationship between the Crown and the Police, etc., is very different from, from England and Wales. So the NCA are, are, are leading that, that international engagement and the structure and the framework, but we've also been doing a number of bilateral contacts and, and um, scenario plans uh, from our own team uh, with a number of those countries that uh, you, you, you might imagine. Thank you. Um, a change of tack, if I may, Chief Constable. Uh, can you explain to the committee, the, the committee has heard on the issue of cyber care, so I've heard from the detective, Chief Superintendent, um, about the challenges that are faced in terms of volume and technicalities, and we're very keen to be supportive of the police having all the necessary resources to, to address these. You want to explain to the committee how just short of half a million pounds was spent on equipment, which was then rolled out without any assessments? I'm aware of the, the, the um, very legitimate and, and helpful interest that this committee in particular has had in, in, in regard to the, the rollout of cyber kiosks. Um, I do think that the team acknowledged and I acknowledge that um, there was a, a failure to fully assess and communicate what we were seeking to do with, with, with um, the capability that we're looking to, to introduce. Um, it was a response to an overwhelming demand and, and, and a demand that the people who are uh, l l least served by our poor response are often the most vulnerable. So, so it's, it's victims of crime, it's witnesses of crime who, who lo lose their mobile device for a number of weeks because we are unable to, 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 to seek the evidence from that that would bring perpetrators uh, to justice as quickly as, as, as we can. Um, and the, the amount of uh, mobile devices that were coming into to, uh, police custody or police possession um, was, was enormous. There's barely an incident that we respond to now that does not have a, a, a mobile device featuring within it, simply because of how people people live their lives. Um, so the work it was paused, it was halted, and, and I was 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 uh, very keen that that was done. Um, there was an acknowledgement that we didn't reach out uh, as broadly as we could. We didn't absolutely establish uh, and, and articulate the clear legal authority and, and rights-based authority for the use of, of, of the equipment. We didn't fully articulate the benefits and, and in my view, um, the ethical priority that, that we needed to have to introduce the, the equipment and, and, and it caused a loss, of, a loss of confidence, certainly around this table and and, and elsewhere. I think that's been rectified um, by the amount of engagement that, that we're, we're now taking. I think it's been rectified by acknowledgement of that. We haven't just continued to plough on and, and ignore the feedback we've had. 
Um, and I think it's been acknowledged by the fact that the, 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 the rollout has been delayed until a number of these key issues are, are addressed. Can I put a, a specific concern to, to you, Chief Constable? And that is that the, the, the particular figure was just, which was 400 and it will be here somewhere, you, you know, um, a few tens of thousands short of half a million, the trigger figure at which that would have be required to be reported to the police authority. Was there any attempt to avoid scrutiny of this by having a, a capital purchase just short of what would have required reference to the police authority? I, 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 absolutely not. I, ab absolutely not. The, um, the, the police authority are now are, are part of uh, this, this engagement. They had an operational awareness a, a, around it, um, but I can categorically you know, give you my word as Chief Constable that that, that type of, of of conduct or, or apparent slate of hand would certainly not and will not happen under my uh, command and role as Chief Constable. Okay, uh, okay thank you for that. Um, the, the external reference group involving the, the uh, Information Commissioner and Scottish Human Rights Commission, um, the most recent update we had was that um, Police Scotland still hadn't heard from the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service about the legal basis for this. Can you update us on that, please? I, I, I have been informed this morning that, that, that the Crown have now written. They've written, I think there's about a three or four uh, page letter that, that's come in. That's being assessed by the team, the individuals, I think, who have, who have been here before. They have undertaken, as I think they have previously, and I, again, have ensured that this will be the case, that they will be in a position to inform uh, the committee of the, the nature of that advice. They'll share that with the rest of the people who are, who are advising them on the reference group and the stakeholder group, uh, and again, work collectively to, to, be, to be clear on what that legal basis is. And if collectively it identifies that there is some gap in the law or there's some ambiguity in the law, again, then collectively um, they'll, they'll work to try and, and address and resolve that. Will you roll out that programme if that legal you don't feel you have comprehensive legal authority to do it? No. Okay. I won't roll, it, won't, it won't be rolled out until I... I'm confident that I, that I, as Chief Constable, have the confidence of, of, of the community that we serve. I may think it's the right thing to do. I do think it's the right thing to do. But I'm clear that at this stage, it, it doesn't have, and, and, and demonstrably doesn't have, the, the overt and patent consent uh, of, of, of the people we serve. And that's demonstrated by uh, the input of, of, of elected representatives such as yourself and other le legitimate groups. So un until I'm satisfied that we can be clear that policing by consent underpins the use of cyber kiosks, we won't be using it. And that's, that's why uh, I was clear that the rollout would be halted until those issues were addressed. Uh, and just finally on this issue, the, the status of that um, advice you've been given by Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service about potential rollout. Is that something you would feel you could share with the committee? Yeah, yes, that, I've asked, I've asked the, the, the team to, to carry out assessment of it. I, again, I'll be, I, I haven't been in a position to digest it, analyse it, assess it. I was, had a full day yesterday. There's, there's, and, and there are many other, other factors on it, but I'm aware that we've now received it. And again, we'll work very, very closely with it. How definitive it is, again, I think we'll, we, will, we will see around that. And I also think there's, there's the ability to take the advice from some of the groups, such as the ICO and Scottish Human Rights Commission and, and other groups to, to, to inform us. Um, but that's, it's, it's, an ex, it's a really, really critical exercise, but the capability and the functionality and the utility of what we're seeking to do. The reason we're trying to do it is to protect the most vulnerable and to make sure that the police service is discharging its duties. But I, I accept the rollout was not done uh, as, as openly and in as engaged a manner as I would have liked it to have happened. OK, thank you for that, Mr. Students. Um, Margaret. Yeah. Um, Chief Constable, the budget for the Fleetney State management for the next financial year is the same as for this financial year, which represents a, a real terms reduction. Could you comment on that and how sustainable you think it is that um, police continue to operate with a £6 million overspend in this area? Thank you. Um, as, as a service, and, and this um, probably is about policing as opposed to the Police Service of Scotland. As, as a service, um, our capital allocation and our capital investment has, 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 over a number of years, been, been consistently less 
than as the size of our organisation requires. So, uh, as in general terms, and I, I, I'm speaking in generality rather than specifics on figures, but in general terms, if the Police Service of Scotland accounts for 3% of the Scottish Government spend, and, and members may correct me, so we're, we're, we spend about $1.2 in revenue, and I think it's about $33 billion the, the Scottish Government revenue spend. If we're about 3% of the revenue spend consistently over the last number of years, our, our capital allegation has been less than 1% of, of, of the capital or capital spend in government. Now, I'm aware, as a citizen in, in Scotland, as a, as a, as a, as a pub, public leader, that you know there are there are financial pressures on all on all governments, and that there are significant investments to be made in schools, hospitals, transport, infrastructure. But it is a statement of fact that in, in the police service, our our capital uh, allowance and allocation has not kept pace with our, our revenue al allocation, and, and as a result. It means that, as a service, we spend less, and I think I've included that in the submission, uh, um, the, the, the written submission, we spend less per officer and staff on capital than, than comparative uh, figures. So if £20,000 is spent per officer in England and Wales on, on capital, i.e. fleet, equipment, uh, property, etc., we spend about six and a half half thousand. Um, so that, that's, that's, a that's a significant challenge to make sure that, as a service, we're, 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 we're properly equipped. Our capital allowance this year, um, collectively, is, is um, about 40%, um, 40 to 45% of, of what we identified we, we would need. And there are elements, there, there are different elements to that. There's a need mm -hmm. to maintain the business as usual, exactly as you allude to, um, fleet, estate, just things that every year we need to we need to, to to make some capital investment within, and at the same time we're trying to make capital investment to allow us to properly transform the, the organisation into one. You, 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 it's well documented the the, the clunky, um, misaligned, uh, contradictory IT infrastructure that we inherited from the legacy arrangements, um, and quite frankly, I think it's been remarkable what officers, staff and the leadership in Police Scotland have been able to do with that system to actually make sense and allow us to, to, to police operationally. But we can't go on like that, and I think there's recognition ar around that. So my challenge is to balance the investment I need to do into fleet, equipment, estates, make sure officers and staff have the right, can, can, can work properly, are equipped to do the work, but at the same time make sure that I, we're also investing in some of these uh, transformational uh, projects and pieces of work that are vital, absolutely vital, to make sure that the service is modernised. So there are challenges at the moment. Uh, I've been very clear and public around those challenges with, 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 with ministers, and, and, and I'm, I'm grateful to, uh, to talk through them further with, with the committee this morning. Um, but but that's, that's part of my duties as Chief Constable, is to try and meet those challenges and, and, and balance those competing demands. Um, but our, our capital allocation is it falls short of what I assess we, we need to, to, to move the service forward. Yeah. Um, it's not just capital. Um, obviously, with the fleet management, there's revenue implications, as there will be with, um, with the estate. So, has it been argued in terms of preventative spend? Because this is an area where things, frankly, are not going to get better and self-evidently are going to get worse as vehicles age, all the potential dangers that, that come with that, and um, just not equ uh, equipping um, our, our officers to do the job that we're asking of them. Yeah, 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 yes, I, I, rec I recognise that, that, that summary as, as, as the challenge we, we, we've got. I mean, our... our Ideally, we would seek to have a, a fleet that, that, that turns over on, a, on, a, on a, anything between a three and a five year cycle, because exactly as you identify, once, once you go past that, you then put pressure on your revenue budget in terms of, of, of the maintenance and, and you know, a need for more mechanics, a need for more, more work ar 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 around that. Um, so, so we have done, I think, I've asked the, 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 the fleet managers, I've asked everybody within the organisation to, to look as closely as they can but at all times, never ever compromising on, on, on safety or, or health and safety. And the Scottish Police Federation um, make a great contribution in that regard because they often highlight issues that, you know, right across the country that, that may arise and then we seek, we seek to, to, to mitigate it. Um, but I think 
if, if we don't have that additional investment that, that I suggested earlier, um, the challenges that you've identified, I think, will become more acute um, into 2021-21 uh, and, and, and beyond. Um, and giving officers and staff the equipment, that's, that's what I'm trying to do on both sides, both maintaining the business as usual, the equipment, the estates, the fleet, but, but critically revising and, and, and improving that, the ICT uh, infrastructure that we have, because that's, that's core equipment that the officers have as well. You know, they, they need digital devices, they need properly functioning systems that they can access data, and they need that so they can do their jobs better, so they can protect the public, and, and they need both. <laughs> and and that's, that's the challenge against the, the, the challenge in financial settlement that we have. There was just one final thing I wanted to ask you about. The Cabinet Secretary has indicated he may return to the capital budget mid-year due to the kind of ex, uh, concerns that have been expressed. But given the urgency of this, um, I consider that to be a little bit short-sighted and inadequate. I wonder if you have a view on it. I've, I've been clear both with the, the police authority, um, with my own officers and staff, and um, in public, as I am, I am doing today, that the, 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 the service as a strategic vulnerability over a number of years, has has not had the capital investment it, 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 it requires. Um, equally, my job is to take whatever allocation I'm given and make sure it's used as shrewdly, make sure, sure it's used in a way that, that maximises the benefit to officers and staff and the public and balances the various demands that, 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 that you've out, outlined this morning. I'm sure you would want that as soon as possible. <laughs> yes, please. I know Daniel's a serious question. Stuart, you have a brief supplementary? In uh, no, I'm going to move it. OK, thank you. Um, Daniel. So, um, Chief Constable, you've made it quite clear that you think that your capital budget should be in the region of £90 million. The, 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 the budget sets it at 35 so you're 60% short of what you say you require. So on top of estates and, and vehicle fleet, what is it that you are not going to be able to do as a result of that capital shortfall that you feel you need to do, given that you've asked for £90 million? Pounds. At this stage, and clearly these budgets are still in draft, it's a, matter, a key matter at the, 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 the Parliament today, I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, we are working through a, a, a series of quite challenging and difficult uh, prioritisations about what do, what do we go ahead with, and what do we stop? We can't even take it on a 1920 view. We need to think what's the best way to maximise the return. There are some projects that if we if we'd be better not starting them at all than than just than, than doing some elements of, of them. Um, but some of the challenges we will have are are around um, a really key priority around the transformation of. What, what we are calling our corporate services and, and, and colloquial being known as, as, as a back office. So the need to integrate eight separate HR departments, eight separate finance departments, resource deployment, um, e everything from citing witnesses to court to, to paying officers and staff over time to moving people around in terms of when they move from one division to one department, geographically, territorial. We have an awful lot of people doing transactional, um, very, very traditional process and paper-driven processes or certainly misaligned processes across the country. There'd be enormous potential to, to invest in a, a, a proper um, corporate services uh, change programme, use some tried and tested ICT frameworks that other organisations uh, utilise. Um, this type of work is, in many ways, is not police specific. This is not to do with organised crime or having, having issues of, of operational security around it. This is essentially organisational, transactional work. Now, we're going to have to slow that which, which is a frustration because, again, we think that could release enormous amounts of saving. So we also think it could improve the quality of the service we give to our own people and, and, and to, to other people who deal with us. Um, and it would, allow, it would release funding capacity money to, re, to reinvest in policing. So that's, that's, that's one example, but there are a number of 
um, ICT programmes of change that, that we, we are probably not going to be able to go ahead with if the capital budget stays as it does. Uh, so, uh, £35 million pounds represents some 3% of your total budget, and 3% capital investment for any organisation on the face of it seems low. But I understand, according to the work, uh, a briefing that you've prepared, uh, on a per-employee uh, basis. Uh, am I uh, right in concluding from, from the, 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 the work that you've put together based on the Chartered Institute of Public Finance Accountants that Police Scotland has a, the fifth worst capital expenditure of uh, all police forces in the UK? Is that, is that correct? And, it, and, and, and what sh should it be if we were looking to comparative forces such as the, the Metropolitan Police? Well, it, it does. We are, we are at the bottom of that, that chart, if you like. And, and as, as I Part of my answer to Mrs. Mitchell was, was alluded to that as well when I said about the the, no, the non-pay costs per head. So we are about six and a half thousand again against an English and Wales average of of, of twenty thousand. Um, we have we have benefited from the maintenance of um, revenue budget to allow us to sustain officer numbers. So since two thousand and two thousand and eight, the, the, there's a there's a, a net differential of over twenty thousand police officers between what England Wales has back in 2008 and what Scotland had in 2008. They've lost um, over 19,000. We've gained yeah, a little bit less than 1,000. Than a, than a so I make that observation simply to say that's, that has benefited, I think, the organisation, the communities of, of, of Scotland. It's allowed us to make significant inroads into violence, significant inroads into the murder rate and, 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 and greater community confidence and greater community cohesion but it's not enough in itself you know you, 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 the, the ultimate if would be or you know, you'd have all the people you like but if they're not equipped properly if they're not resourced properly if they don't have the vehicles that are that, 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 that are properly service them if they don't have the IT that properly enables them um, that that is then becomes a, a, a false investment so it's that balance between making sure we've got the right capability we've got the right uh, capacity in terms of numbers, but crucially, crucially, that whoever we have, whether they're police officers or whether they're police staff, that they've got the right equipment to deal with policing in the 21st century. And as an organisation, I'm not looking for state-of-the-art, sort of cutting-edge ICT. I'm looking for tried and tested ICT that any organisation would expect to function with. We're still working in, in, in a, not even in an analogue age, we're still uh, working with pen and paper in many areas, in many instances, uh, and I don't think it's sustainable going forward. I mean, just on the ICT point, I mean, we've obviously in previous sessions looked at some detail in your, your proposed £300 million pound ICT programme. Is that a threat given this budget settlement, and where, where does that sit given the, the, the capital allocation you're looking at? Clearly, we can't realise all our ambition this year against that the, the, the draft uh, al allocation. The overall programme, and again, it is eye-watering amount, amounts of money, I accept and, and recognise that, but, the, but what it was was, was a, a, as a coherent single structure for the, the policing in Scotland. It's something that we've never had. Again, this is not a Police Scotland issue. We've never had that clear framework, that clear needs requirement, whatever language you want to use, for policing in Scotland, and, and, and we now have that. And I think Audit Scotland and others have recognised that that has been a step forward. The challenge for us now is looking at the pace of implementation and looking at the prioritisation of implementation and looking at the sequencing around that. And, and that's the work, very, very hard, difficult, challenging work that's ongoing at the moment, both between people who are in finance and ICT, but, but crucially, but also by operational police officers and those that, those that lead operational teams in terms of what is the greatest priority, where can we get the biggest return on our investment. But the, the full extent of our ambition cannot be realised. It may have to be delayed, deferred, uh, reprioritised. Re, re um, but that's, that's, those are the challenges that we've got. So can I ask one last question around the revenue budget and indeed police officer numbers? And, and forgive me, that there may be a few numbers in this question, but... I mean, my understanding is that according to the, the Federation, they, they were saying that that, that 16,800 number, again, a number that you used, that that was what the budget, which is in, from the draft budget, essentially made, enabled um, 
that, that you would need to reach that number in order to be within your budget. So given that you are now talking about uh, uh, having the level at 17,200, um, so that's some uh, 400 above that figure. And indeed, there's also the other concern I have, and I, and I know this was brought up at the board meeting yesterday, that there's some 140 officers that are funded by local authorities, and that a number of local authorities, including here in Edinburgh, are looking at withdrawing that, that funding, which by my estimates is worth some six and a half million pounds. I, I'm just concerned that, 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 that those uh, officer levels um, are, are, are going to lead you to uh, uh, an increased deficit rather than eliminating that def deficit. Is that a concern? I mean, how big a concern? And, or, or how do you intend to address that tension between officer numbers and, and revenue funding? Every, everything you've said, I think, accurately reflects the, the, the challenges that, that, that we've got. Just one point of clarification is it isn't. It isn't, I am increasing by 100. I'm just bringing forward 100 recruits earlier. We're still working. What, what I've said in terms of the 1920 budget at this stage, at this stage, I'm not planning to reduce by the 300 from 17134 to 16834 as I'd originally planned. And because of the imminence of Brexit, I'm just going to bring 100 forward. Now, it may be that if Brexit changes its profile, and as Mr MacArthur suggested, there's, there's some intervening changes in, in, the, in the political settlement, well, then I'll be in a position, if, if you like, to turn, turn down the tap of, of recruitment and, and slow recruitment and potentially, potentially try to, to readjust uh, the, the, the budget in, in line. But it will be enormously challenging, and that's what I said yesterday at the police authority, and, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to, to discuss it with, with you uh, this afternoon. There is a real challenge and a real, a real difficulty for us in, in, in reducing our deficit at the end of 1920, and then ultimately reducing the deficit to zero at the end of 2021, as, as was our intention, um, if uh, we are maintaining officer numbers. And my judgment and, 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 it, and it's one that I've, I've, I've spent a lot of time reflecting upon and, and, and taking advice on, but ultimately it's my decision as, as Chief Constable and the operational independence that vests in that office, my judgment is that, that, <coughs> is that it would not be prudent to th at this stage to, to work towards 16800 until we get more certainty around the Brexit challenges. Thus, my request for some additional funding to support the organisation to make sure that the deficit doesn't grow as, as, as you correctly identify. So, if I may, just as a, as a brief clarification, just to put a number on that, I think you used the, the quote of the figure of £12 million pounds for the, the 300 which you would have needed to, 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 to reduce by to meet your budget. And again, clearly the community officers must be some concern, but I mean, if I was to say that that budgetary challenge is around £18 million, pounds, would that be a sort of the correct uh, order of magnitude in terms of the budgetary challenge that you're facing regarding officer numbers and revenue funding? It, it, wouldn't, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be far off it. And again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sitting myself with my figures. And, and as you say, there's a, there are an awful lot of figures assessment round, round about that. I think the point about local authority funded officers is a relevant one as well, because that is uh, an inheritance that, that, again, we inherited from legacy arrangements. They were, they were very different depending on um, the 32 local authorities and depending on, 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 the, on the legacy forces. Um, at this stage, my assessment is that we've got roughly about 145 officers that are continue to be directly funded um, from, from local authorities. And therefore, there's a... There's a ethical duty on me to make sure that those officers are clearly seen doing community-based work in the local authorities who, who fund them. Um, but it does then give me a challenge, if I need then to exert the operational independence I have, to move those officers around the country or move them into different duties depending on emerging threat, risk and harm. So it's another, it's another piece of funding rationalisation that I would be keen to try and address, but it's, 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 it's difficult because it, it, it's, it's run over, over a period of time. Um, and and we, include it, we include it in our overall officer figures, um, but not all of those figures are clearly funded directly from 
Scottish Government grant because they're, 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 there is that local authority funding. And it, and it therefore creates a bit of vulnerability when local government are under pressure uh, and, and local government may seek to withdraw from that. But not, not all local authorities have. A number of them, thankfully, have continued to, to, to support us. Thank you. Okay, Daniel, thank you. Um, Rona. Yes, thanks, Convener. Um, yes, I wonder if you could maybe clarify um, the additional um, money that you'll have since the change in the VAT policy. Um, can you maybe um, tell us, would that go to capital or revenue? Would it perhaps help with the fleet management um, problem? Um, do you have what plans? Do you have? I know you won't have any difficulty spending it, but what plans do you have for it? Well, it's, 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 it's now um, mainstreamed, if you like, in, into our... Our, our, our revenue allocation, and, and again, we're, we were we were grateful for that. Um, prior to that, the 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 VAT that that um, we couldn't recover, um, we were we were recompensated for it, if you like, through through what was called the the the, the reform uh, budget at, at that time. So when the question's asked, and I think I think I've I hope. I've outlined it. If I haven't, I can I can provide further information to to the committee. You, what did you do with the reform money that, that you were given? And it is and it is it is a good question. The truth is, a lot a lot of the reform money we were given in the early years went. Uh, it was it, it was to pay the VAT. So the Scottish government gave us this reform money, and it was also then uh, to 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 utilise for a VR ER system as as people left the organisation. We didn't use it as as um, wisely or as shrewdly as with the benefit of hindsight we would have liked to have done to invest in in some of the change programs that that that, that are now ov overdue but in terms of the VAT, that's now mainstreamed in, in into our uh, into our core budget um, i do I, I mean i i am very grateful and and again recognizing the pressure on the public purse um, that there is real time protection built in to uh, the police budget um, but I also think it's important for, for, for everybody to recognise that that real-time protection, you know, sort of kicked in, I think, at sort of the end of 15-16, of, of, uh, after which um, we had already taken out, in real terms, about £200 million from, from the, the cost of policing. So the cost of policing um, prior to the single service, um, you know, was, was literally £200 million more that, than it is now in, in real terms. And that's the legacy cost of, of over three of the legacy, legacy forces. So I'm really grateful for the, the real-time protection, but, but I would also make a plea that there, there's a, a recognition made that, that the police service, through the, 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 the structure of reform, has actually been able to, 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 to save uh, significant amounts of money of, of the public purse. And not, not all reform programmes are able to do that and, and point to that. Um, it was difficult. You know, and again, we didn't get everything right as we went through that. We didn't always take our people with us. People were disorientated. Um, uh, partners and communities and others at times were frustrated with, with some of the changes that, that were implemented. I, I, I absolutely accept that, but I do think it's really, really important to recognise that there's been significant savings made by policing that, that are now back in uh, the public purse that, that wouldn't have been there had we not created the single service. Thank you. And ju just very briefly, ha have you or the Scottish Police Authority had any discussions with the UK government about the back payment, um, or are you leaving that to politicians? I, I, I haven't. It's similar to the, the question earlier. Um, I, I, the only time I would speak to UK ministers would be around matters that are reserved in terms of, of um, operational priorities such as counter-terrorism or, or, or national security. But when it comes to, to funding arrangements, um, the complexity of it and the constitutional uh, ins and outs of it, for want of a better phrase, are such that I think it's best left to, to the politicians and best left to the police authority to go and, and, and represent the interests of, of, of policing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel, a brief supplementary on this. You just mentioned uh, UK involvement in counter-terrorism. I think there was a, a press report a, a few days ago that there had been discussions about changing uh, Police Scotland's involvement in the counter-terrorism network. I was just wondering if you could provide any insight into kind of what yeah. your thoughts or, or, or plans were, or just kind of give you the opportunity to deny that. that no, I, I'm, I'm, again, I, I'm, I'm grateful, grateful for the question, grateful for the opportunity to absolutely clarify there's no intention whatsoever um, for... 
uh, the Police Service of Scotland to step away from the UK counter-terrorism uh, network. Um, I, myself, was totally unaware of any thoughts or observations, but um, I, I, don't, I don't discourage officers and, and functional heads and managers from thinking around about options when they're, they're faced with challenges. Again, as I said earlier, we need to be as creative and as open-minded as, as, as we can. But any decision such as that would, would, would ultimately come to me to make. Uh, and I am extremely reluctant uh, to, to move away from that network and that structure. And the reason for that is that, in my judgment, you know, the best way to protect the people and communities of Scotland is for Scotland to be part of that CT network and, and structure. And we will benefit if, God forbid, we are ever subject to, to, to a terrorist attack. But, but we participate in that. We work to common standards of interoperability. We work to, to common standards of, of intelligence sharing and, 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 and operational practice. Um, and that allows us to do, as, as we did when Manchester was attacked, to immediately send you know, over 50 detectives down to, short, to, to assist in the short term. We send um, armed response vehicles in the short term to, to assist our colleagues in the safe knowledge that should there ever be a, a similar attack here, we'll get the benefit of, of those resources. So there's no, in, no intention uh, on my part, and it would be a decision for me and no one else, to step away from the UK counter-terrorism network. Thank you. It's good to hear. Thank you. Um, our intention is to conclude uh, the meeting about um, uh, quarter past. So a couple of lots of questions to, to come, Stuart, and then Liam. This will need short answers on three separate subjects, I have to say. Um, in, incidentally, an observation, um, I started my IT career in the 1960s and spent 30 years there. I will continue to believe there is still a place for paper and pencil, and I hope there's not a headlong rush to automate everything until the technology is mature. Seriously, though, um, you talked about the diversity of IT systems. We understand that. You also made reference to diverse HR systems, uh, where I think IT was part of it, but also process was part of it. Are there other as yet substantially incomplete parts of the integration system which should be being reflected in the finance you're getting just now? And as I say, fairly briefly, if I may, Chief Constable. Fundamentally, ICT is, is, is the biggest challenge. Um, a lot of the operational practice has, has been aligned. The response to murders, domestic abuse, rape, response to terrorism, response to antisocial behaviour. That has, has, we've got common standards that are then um, implemented um, with a local flavour depending on, on, on the needs, but the standards are, are, are common. It is mostly around about ICT where the complexity of getting a, a, a consistent framework and a, a, a consistent um, ICT product for each of the challenges, whether it's crime, whether it's missing persons, whether it's the handling of, of productions and property, um, that's, that's the biggest challenge in, in brief. Okay. Thank you very much. That, that's quite clear. Now, that's all part of reform and, uh, and, and change. But of course, even when you've completed the process, I imagine that reform is a continuous part of the process. Would you like to just say a little bit about what you're doing on that, and since we're talking about budgets, whether you're getting adequate financial support to continue to improve the performance and operational efficiency? In, in my judgment, the, the, the quality of policing that goes on in, in, in Scotland is, is extremely high. You know, I've, I've just finished a Christmas and New Year period where I did not have to account for great difficulties at some of the public events that we had, whether it's football matches, Hogmanay celebrations. We did, we did not have really challenging uh, out, outbreaks of crime in particular communities or unsolved homicides or, or a poor police response and difficult issues. The, the, the operational response that the, the men and women right across Scotland are doing, I think, is, is, is extremely high. Um, the challenge, I think, in terms of change, and, and I absolutely agree with you that you know, simply introducing um, ICT systems, although vital in itself, will not make the change. The biggest challenge for me, I think, is roundabout building a, a, 
a common culture and, 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 a, and a shared set of values. Now, we benefit from that in policing in Scotland. Um, we all have trained through the police college at Tully Allen, um, but inevitably, when you bring eight legacy forces together, people come uh, with their own their own background, and that's right and proper in, the, in their own pr proud traditions. In the early years, and I was there, I was part of it, we prioritised consistency and conformity and standardisation, and, and I would argue that we needed to do that to, so that everybody got to a common standard, what we expected a victim of domestic abuse would, would get, what we expected a perpetrator of domestic abuse would get in terms of bail visits and, and, and other investigatory measures. We've now established that, and, and my priority, and, and I'm absolutely committed to this, is now within that framework of, of common standards and high quality, now allowing much greater autonomy at a local level, um, where officers and staff, local commanders, local officers, they know their communities best, they know their partners, whether it's in health, social work, third sector, community groups, allow them to go and police um, in their areas exercise the discretion that, that comes with, it, with the Office of Constable, but exercise it within uh, the framework that's there. So that's the, in terms of the reform, in some ways it's, it's, it's to use the, the great benefits we've got from the single service, but make sure it's more agile, more flexible, more tailored to local needs. And that's a, that's, that's a significant challenge. Well, you've now talked about local innovation, would be the label I might use. Given that that will have value in local communities, how is that local innovation being reflected and transferred to other domains in the police service where it might be of some value? Have you a distinct formal process for doing that? I, 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 absolutely. And, and again, we've, we've strengthened the, the senior leadership team in, in Police Scotland. You know, going into the early part of 2019 feels very different from where we were this, this time last year. There, 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 we, there was a a lack of resilience, there was, there was stress and strain uh, in, the, in the leadership team. Um, we've been able to recruit a number of, of really high value individuals. Fiona Taylor has returned to Scotland. Will Kerr has joined from the National Crime Agency, having served in Northern Ireland for many years. And Will Kerr is now leading a, 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 a structured discipline approach, exactly as you outlined, to make sure that local initiatives, local uh, best practice is then identified and not simply then imposed somewhere else, because by definition <laughs> it might not necessarily work there, but the principles, the, the, the capability, the tactics, if, if, if appropriate, are then, are then widely known. And that's, that's getting done in a, in a disciplined manner. And again, it's that relationship between having an overview and an oversight of the country as a whole and, and allowing best practice to, to, to flourish. And again, yesterday at the, at the public meeting down in Kilmarnock of the police authority, there was a lot of work done um, that the, the, the local division there are doing about trauma-informed policing and, and, and making sure that their officers and staff have, have awareness of adverse childhood experiences and how they work locally. We'll take the learning from that. We won't simply impose it everywhere. We'll take the learning from that and see how other divisions and communities can benefit. And finally, in the remaining 30 seconds, I think the convener suggests I probably have, um, you used the word agile. Uh, are you specifically looking at agile project management techniques? Because projects are inputs, outputs, and time. And if you can squeeze the time, you get the benefit faster and you spend less money. Are you deliberately looking at processes to do smaller projects more often and get the benefit streams running faster or other approaches that relate to agile project management? It's a, it's, a, it's a very good question. I, 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 you may wish to write to us if it's a very long answer. Well, you know? well I, 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 I will do. I, what, I, what I would say briefly is that it, it relates to a question earlier about, you know, we had, a, we had a plan for our digital investment. We now need to readjust it given our capital allowance. So therefore, in, 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 as part of that, part of the assessment is about achievability. And therefore, if we can achieve that quickly, let's do that as opposed to maybe a more complex a pro, a project or programme that might take greater time, but again, I, I would, I'm, I'm grateful for all the assistance and advice that, that is available. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Liam. You know, we've talked earlier about police numbers, we've talked also about um, some of the changes in relation to um, uh, paying conditions and, and, and pensions. In response to Stuart Stevenson, you've just talked about um, the importance of, of, of training and reaching certain standards. 
we've had exchanges in this committee and, and out with it about the issue of officer and staff well-being. And I think it's been accepted that in terms of the investment in the ongoing training and, and continuous professional development, particularly for those that are moving into more senior um, uh, management roles and, 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 and roles with greater degrees of responsibility, it's been accepted that it, in the recent past, some of that work hasn't been done, that people have been put into roles, possibly on a temporary basis, uh, and, and, and almost expected to learn on the job. Is there anything you can point to in the last 12 months which suggests that some of that is being addressed? Uh, and probably more importantly, what are the intentions over the next three to five years uh, to ensure that, that that shortcoming in terms of officer and staff wellbeing is being, is being addressed? Thank you. And Again, that, that summary you, you provided as part of your question is one that I, I, I would identify with. I think, I've, I've, again, I've, I've said it either here or, 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 or in other quarters, and that's why people <laughs> is an absolute you know, priority for me and, 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 and the organisation. People, ICT investment, and greater flexibility, greater uh, local profile of policing. These are the three sort of principles that I've... I've you know, overtly stated and, and will take forward in, in, in my role as, as Chief Constable. Over the last year, um, we've done significant work, um, starting with, it, with, it, with, it, with the work around about wellbeing. I personally have, have led that for, for, for the last two years. Um, we have a network of wellbeing champions who are not, not distant figures in, in um, any sort of departmental offices. They're all people who are well-respected individuals within teams and, and operational units people who are there to signpost people to, to employee assistance programmes, whether it's financial pressure, whether it's mental health, whether, whether it's fitness issues, whatever it may be, um, and the commitment around that in terms of some practical support, but also just the, 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 the personal commitment to wellbeing. I think we've, we've made steps, significant steps around from a, a low base, I accept there's more, there's more work to be done. On a formal basis, we've revised our leadership program. We've now got a, a, a senior leaders uh, a program that which a number of our senior officers, uh, superintendent, chief superintendent uh, rank, have, have performed in. We have an emerging leading leaders program for sort of newly promoted uh, inspectors. We're revising um, what we call our first line managers course, which is an old money as a sergeant's course, um, but also includes uh, support staff members who provide that role. And we're revising entirely our whole approach to officer assessment and appraisal and, and promotion. Um, there's an awful lot of work getting done in that area. I've, I personally um, are really, really committed to that because your summary about our underinvestment around that in, in the early years is, is something that I, 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 I feel very closely because as a younger officer coming through, I benefited from a lot of inputs, training opportunities that, that uh, some officers have not had. So we need to get that back on its feet in, in short term, and we've begun to do that. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to provide further detail ar around that. I mean, what you've, I mean, that's in, in, encouraging, um, but a process in, in place is, is one thing. I think in early exchanges, you've been t talking about the pressure that officers are under for a whole variety of reasons. The, the easiest thing often to do is to postpone or delay um, uh, further training or, or, or whatever. What safeguards are you putting in place to ensure that that, that doesn't happen, that the, the, the training, however difficult it is to accommodate with the, the other responsibilities and the demands on an individual's time, is taking place in a timely fashion? It, it, it's given priority, straight, straightforward. I mean, the language we would use, it's, it's a duty parade, it's not, it's not optional. And, and, and therefore, given that priority, it allows local commanders, it allows officers themselves to know that it, it, it's it's not a matter of I feel I feel guilty going away to, to this training course for this week because I know you know my own team are are, are are busy. Well, actually, we need to make that investment as an organisation. We need to to make sure that if uh, if additional support needs to go somewhere to allow those officers to go and take that training, it'll, it'll take place, and, and and that that's what we're going to do. Okay, we have no further questions. Can I thank you, Chief Constable, for your frankness? Um, we have regular contact with Police Scotland and, and get updated information, and I'm sure that will continue. So thank you very much for uh, attendance here today, and that now ends the public session of the meeting. Thank you.